Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're going to talk about the Battle of Savo Island, one of the greatest defeats for the U.S. Navy. This battle was fought in August of 1942, shortly after the invasion of Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is a relatively small island at the southern tip of the Solomon Islands, and the Japanese were building an airstrip in the jungle on the island. This airstrip would allow them to dominate the convoy routes to Australia, one of the United States' allies during World War II. Uh, it would also allow them to use it as a stepping stone to take further allied island bases that were part of our inner defensive ring completely isolate Australia uh, and basically knock them out of the war. So, almost simultaneously to an invasion of North Africa, the United States prepares this invasion of Guadalcanal. It's quite a shoestring operation. Uh, partially because so much of the fleet had been destroyed at Pearl Harbor, but also because of uh, the Naval Arms Limitation Treaties of the 1920s and 30s. During World War I, invasions like this would be escorted by the pre-dreadnought battleships and armored cruisers of the fleet, the, the older obsolete vessels uh, that had considerable firepower but could be afforded to be thrown away. The Washington and London Naval Treaties caused all of those ships and even older dreadnoughts to be discarded so that by 1942 the obsolete disposable type ships were actually quite modern and for the United States these were the tin clad treaty heavy cruisers. These ships would bear the brunt of the fighting around the Solomon Islands uh, and their crews would suffer heavily from the misuse of the ships and uh, their general expendability. Right now, we're in the battleship's Combat Information Center. This was a World War II designed space which incorporated all of the various radar and sensor equipment into one compartment so that an officer could coordinate all of the different sighting reports from surface, air, and subsurface targets uh, relative to the ship. And this information could be used to give the captain a clearer picture of the battle. This space is commonplace on Navy ships today, and Battleship New Jersey even had a second space similar to this called the Combat Engagement Center added in the 1980s. However, by 1942, radar was a brand new technology for the U.S. Navy. Uh, it had been used pretty well in shore installations during the Battle of Britain, but uh, for ships, it was still kind of new. Using air and surface search radars to detect ships, you could see them out maybe past 20 miles, depending on how high you put the radar, so only slightly beyond visual range under the best of conditions. Uh, you couldn't run the waveguides for the radar particularly far, so on uh, this ship, we're down inside the armored citadel. On older ships that had it retrofitted, the radar was up in the fairly unarmored superstructure where it was uh, subject to blast damage, combat damage, all sorts of uh, stuff, mechanical failures and even weathering. The U.S. Navy, by this point, had already come to rely on radar. They had used it to detect incoming Japanese strikes, in Coral Sea, Midway, and other engagements. Um, however, they had not yet realized the limitations of the radar when you're operating inside of an island chain, when there's a bunch of land masses reflecting uh, off of your radar. And uh, a ship operating near a landmass is just going to show up as a return of that landmass on your radar screen. So, the American ships had supported the invasion of 
Guadalcanal uh, and had escorted the carriers and the transports, done naval gunfire support, and generally been at general quarters for a couple of days. So on the night of August 8th, they stand down to condition two, which is half of the crew can sleep and half of the crew continues to man their battle stations. And it was hot and they were tired and uh, generally they thought they were the better fighting force and they, they didn't keep up a vigilant watch. A Japanese fleet under Admiral Tanaka had been formed northern uh, near Truck Lagoon in the, at the northern end of the Solomon Islands. And uh, this was a force of eight ships, a single destroyer, and a bunch of older cruisers. And they weren't necessarily a squadron that was used to operating together before. He just grabbed all the ships he had in the area. Uh, the Japanese were not expecting an American counteroffensive at this point in the war. They certainly weren't expecting it in the Solomon Islands. Uh, and initial Japanese plans were not to contest American invasions of the Outer Island Rings. It was to bleed the Americans as they fought their way through the rings and then fight a single uh, conclusive battle near Japan. Well, Tanaka is an aggressive commander. He's got some units available to him, so he hears of this invasion, he gathers them all together, and he starts sailing down the slot, which is uh, a channel between the two parallel rings of islands that form the Solomon Island chain. Uh, he's spotted by American submarines and uh, Allied coast watchers and Allied aircraft, uh, and a series of miscommunications, reports that they're, uh, they, they have float plane tenders with them and those aren't surface combatants, so they're probably just doing an escort mission. Uh, other information isn't related in time, it doesn't make it to the right Allied commanders, uh, so it's generally written off as no big concern. Uh, had the Allied commanders plotted their course, they would have realized that this Japanese force could reach them at Guadalcanal right after dark. Now, the American ships had radar picket destroyers out to give an early warning. The Japanese fleet sailed straight past them, uh, close enough that the Japanese could see the American ships. The U.S. Navy did not train extensively in nighttime fighting. Uh, because they did not, they assumed that other navies did not either. You fight in daytime when your optical rangefinders can be most effective. Well, the Japanese had spent a considerable amount of time before the war training in nighttime conditions. So even though they had a pickup fleet that uh, weren't used to operating together, they all knew how to operate at night. Uh, and they had doctrines of how to use flares and searchlights and other things to illuminate enemy targets uh, and destroy them. The American disposition during the battle uh, was also split up. While well, the Japanese could concentrate their eight ships into a single uh, line of battle, essentially, the Americans uh, were split up. They had to guard the invasion beaches on Guadalcanal, which still had transports nearby, which were still unloading supplies. At the same time, they had to guard the approaches, and there were three separate approaches divided by islands. A couple of the American and Australian cruisers were off guarding one of these island passes and never even got engaged in the battle. And the rest were divided into groups of uh, three to four heavy cruisers and a couple of destroyers. Uh, on each side of Savo Island in what would become known as Iron Bottom Sound. Uh, these two forces being divided meant that they could not mutually support each other and due to communications failures during the battle, uh, neither force knows that the other one has been engaged. Further complicating things for the Allies, Admiral Crutchley is in command. He is an Australian commander uh, in the Australian cruiser, HMAS Australia. He is called to a conference on Admiral Turner's flagship, 
who is the amphibious commander. So he takes his cruiser and goes there to confer with the Marine Corps General Vanderbilt and Admiral Turner. Um, and so he misses the entire battle and the Allies effectively have no command structure in place during the battle. The Japanese fleet was able to attack the Allied forces completely uh, by surprise, even though the Allies had every chance to see they were coming. Uh, first, the Japanese launched float planes, which would drop flares behind the Allied ships and illuminate them from behind. For many of the Allied ships, this was the first warning they had that enemy ships were there. The cruiser Canberra, one of the largest ships of the Australian Navy, a British-designed county-class cruiser, was the first to be taken under fire, uh, and she would subsequently sink as a result of damage taken. The American cruiser Chicago, operating with her, uh, was caught completely unawares, had no idea what was going on. Theoretically, the captain of the Chicago was the next senior person after Admiral Crutchley and should have taken over command of the battle. Uh, but he turned Chicago due west for 40 minutes and escaped the battle area, also leaving the transports completely undefended. His ship took a torpedo in the bow, but otherwise survived to fight another day. The American destroyer Patterson was probably the only ship in the fleet that had taken the aerial observation reports from earlier in the day seriously, was at general quarters and spotted the Japanese ships. She is the only ship that radioed that uh, Japanese ships had entered the sound and were attacking. Uh, and she got into a gun duel with the Japanese ships until they disappeared into the darkness. Somehow, the other force of American cruisers, comprised of three modern New Orleans-class uh, cruisers, was caught completely unaware, even though they were attacked significantly later than the uh, other Allied force. They had missed the radio communications, and Chicago's commanding officer had failed to uh, warn them. That fleet was also destroyed in detail. One of the biggest issues with the Allied ships at this point in the war was they had their aviation facilities mounted amidships. The cruisers were not uh, deep enough at the stern at this point to have their aircraft hangar back there, such as uh, Battleship New Jersey carried her aircraft on the stern. These ships carried them amidships in the same place they carried their boats. The boats and aircraft uh, were wood and aluminum, both materials that burn at relatively low temperatures, and they were all fully fueled. This meant that any hit amidships could catch as many as five aircraft and a half a dozen boats on fire and create a huge conflagration, uh, which would then set off the ready service lockers. Uh, inexplicably, at this point, the ready service lockers were kept completely full of ammunition instead of just carrying uh, the ammunition they needed until the crew got to general quarters. Uh, so during the battle, none of these ships emptied their ready service lockers. However, it was a lot of explosives outside of protected magazines that were able to go up. Uh, furthermore, these ships had still wooden furnishings and decorations, particularly in captain's cabins, which also burned. Uh, in some places, the fire was so hot that it caused the paint to start to burn. So following this battle, American general uh, damage control procedures improved considerably and ships were designed completely differently. This is an AFFF mixing station. AFFF stands for Aqueous Film Forming Foam. Uh, and this is a system which has its own pumps associated with it, so it can take seawater and firefighting foam, mix it together, and send it around the ship. For uh, a regular fire, say a piece of wood is burning, you could just spray that with water. 
But a triple F is great for if you have fuel burning, such as from your aircraft or your small boats. Because if you spray that with water, the fuel is going to continue to float on top of the water and continue to burn. Uh, and as you wash down the compartment that's on fire, you're going to raise the water level above the watertight door, and that fire is then going to flow into the next space. A triple F will smother the fire. So this is one of those spaces that New Jersey was retrofitted with, and it's one of several A triple F mixing stations on board. In the end, after destroying the two Allied cruiser forces, Admiral Tanaka could have easily taken his cruiser force into the anchorage and sunk the American transport ships. However, he didn't have a complete picture of the battlefield any better than the American commanders did. Uh, he had no idea what other Allied ships were there, uh, and as it got closer to sunrise, he was concerned that as his ships retreated from the battle area, they would be attacked by American carrier aircraft. He could not have known that the American carriers, fearing a Japanese nighttime attack, had already withdrawn uh, well beyond the range of being able to help the invasion forces. Uh, so the battle could have been a more complete success, and, and Tanaka is often criticized for not pushing his advantage after destroying the escort forces. However, the loss of all of their own escorting cruisers caused the American uh, transport ships to up and leave the next day. The Marines on the island were left without all of the supplies that they had brought because they didn't have time to offload it all. And so they would fight uh, for a significant period of time without the major resupply they were expecting uh, until the Allies could regain control of the waters around the island. Uh, this would go on for a while with the Allies having local air superiority and being able to sail ships in during the day, uh, but the Japanese having naval superiority and being able to control the waves at night. Uh, and so the two forces continued to resupply uh, with less than either force needed, and so the battle dragged on for close to six months and it would take another series of naval battles in the waters around Guadalcanal to finally decide the fate of the Solomon Islands. Why didn't the either side deploy battleships? Both sides had them. Uh, they had both older disposable battleships and new fast battleships that could have operated in these waters. Uh, new Jersey herself was not ready to go yet. Uh, she was still a couple months out from being launched, but the first of the American fast battleships, like USS North Carolina, were ready, and they were in the South Pacific. Well, these fast battleships were escorting the carrier forces, and they were not disposable, so they were not going to be risked uh, in a nighttime close-range battle off Guadalcanal. The older, slower battleships were real fuel hogs, and we were at the absolute limit of our supply chain, and we were trying to simultaneously supply uh, an invasion of Guadalcanal, an invasion in North Africa, and Great Britain and Russia in Europe. So we, we just didn't have the ships or the fuel reserves to get them from the mainland U.S. or Pearl Harbor down to the Solomon Islands. It was all we could do to keep the carriers and the lighter ships refueled. Uh, and so you see unarmored cruisers being thrown against each other, uh, and the, the Allied cruisers at this point were really inferior to their Japanese counterparts. Uh, American cruisers did not carry torpedoes, because the Americans were worried that the torpedoes were going to explode uh, and damage the ship. The Japanese had the best torpedoes in the world and armed their cruisers with as many as 12 launchers with reloads. So these torpedoes did a considerable amount of damage. Uh, furthermore, the Japanese ships did not limit themselves to the same 10,000 tons that the Allies did when they adhered to the Washington Naval Treaty. Thanks for watching. Uh, remember, if you have any comments or questions, drop them in the comment section down below, and we'll get back to you. 
Uh, if you are interested in supporting the museum or our YouTube channel, check the description below for ways you can donate. And uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe to be notified when we're putting out more content.